Okay. Good morning, everyone. My name is Lori Ripplinger. I've been an account manager with Uyghurs Financial and Benefits for two and a half years. I've been in the group benefits industry for over eight years. My name is Matthew Hill. I'm an advisor. I've been with Uyghurs for five years and in the industry for about eight. My pet peeve, cold offices. <laughs> My pet peeve, warm offices. <laughs> I have a fan going 24-7, and they still come in. It's so cool, can we turn it off? It's so cold. I have a snowman blanket at my desk. <laughs> uh, my bucket list item is I am going to be writing a children's book. And mine would be hopefully one day going to go see the World Cup for soccer. All right. So to begin, we are not lawyers. We are not tax specialists. We are not labor standards or HR specialists. We are Uyghurs Financial and Benefits, and we can provide you with tips and tools in the form of checklists, templates, and education to help you with any group benefits issues. This quiz is a sampling of just a few of the situations our office has seen over the past few years. Uh, it's important to note that every situation is unique and to consult a specialist where it's appropriate. Okay, question one. One of our employees refuses to join our benefits plan. Can I force him? Anybody want to take a crack at this one? If you don't have an answer with your hand, you've got to pass it to the next table that might have an answer. <laughs> <laughs> answers B. See, the answer is B. And why is that? Well, we'll put you on the spot a little bit. Can we turn that back on now, Bill? Okay. Yep. Everything it says is I think it's correct. <laughs> oh, that's that's so a, I don't have much more of an answer. No, <laughs> you stand by your guns. No, that's good. <laughs> no, that, that it, it, it is kind of. Oh, we have another. B. Get a couple Phil, with B. Matt, just because I am going to sneak through the tables and try and get to people, but it's like really tough. Um, so Fantastic. just make sure you repeat if if it's not loud enough. It's at the front so or speak very loud, people. I'll we have a couple of answers of B so far. A, and Michael says A. <laughs> so this, this was kind of a trick question. The answers are really A, B, and D. Yes, no, and maybe. <laughs> Which, great one to start off with. Just throw you a curve ball right off the hop. So my, Michael is right. Uh, on a mandatory plan, group benefits plans are, are quite often a condition of your employment. The more people you have on the plan, the more people you have paying premiums, the more of a, of a buffer you have for higher claim levels. Uh, B, no. You were also right with no. Uh, there are times where some employees will absolutely refuse. Right? There's nothing you can do in that point. Like, like you said, you can't necessarily force them to do it. So in that case, we have a waiver letter. And you can, you can read some of the text on our forms right here. So the waiver letter, we recommend you sit down. Should I take this guy off? Or? Good? Okay. Uh, we recommend that you sit down with the employee who's refusing. On the waiver letter, it essentially says that the employee and their heirs forfeit any benefits to being on this plan. And if at a later date they want to go on the plan, they, have, they would be fully medically underwritten. And even if they're approved for coverage, they would have uh, reduced levels of dental. So sit down with the employee, they fill the form out and read it right in front of you. Sometimes they'll be like, ooh, this is a little, a little too extreme for me, I'm not gonna take the risk. And D, maybe. So every plan has a participation requirement. So essentially that means that X number of your employees should be participating on your group benefits plan. That number varies from 70% to around 100, uh, depending on the contract. But Picture this scenario in mind. So say you're, you're giving employees the option to whether to be on or not, which we do not recommend. And you're at 60% participation, but your plan requires 70 to remain active. Those next couple employees that, that, that come on board, you're not gonna be able to give them a choice. Like you have to make them join to keep your participation requirements to keep the plan active. So it, it, it's a situation that you really don't want to be in. Yeah. We always recommend that it's uh, a condition of their employment. If you're going to work for me, you're on the benefits plan. The benefits plan is there to benefit the employees. Kind of makes sense. Please. All right. Yeah. Number two, some employees don't return their enrollment applications to me on time. 
What will happen if I don't sign them up in time? So we'll read through the answers. A, they will be considered a late applicant and refused coverage unless they provide proof of good health. We kind of touched on that, didn't we? Mm -hmm. uh, B, if they become sick or die, you might find yourself involved in a lawsuit. C, depending on your carrier and if your plan is mandatory, the coverage may be backdated to the correct month. You and your employee will owe the amount of premium for those past months. And D, you will find yourself planning a steak night to fund the employee's wages after he gets hurt snowmobiling. So what do you guys think about that with these late applicants? I gave oh, I you your application. Actually, all the answers are correct. <laughs> um, what do we recommend? We recommend that when you're onboarding that brand new employee on day one, you're giving them the tour of the office or the plant, you're filling out all your tax forms, you have them fill out that benefit form right then and there. You get them to fill it out, you put them on the plan. It is much easier in the event that that employee does not work out to take them off of the plan at a later date than to try and put them on as a late applicant. What happens, guys, though, if someone says, can I take it home because I'm not sure how to fill out the rest of it like the beneficiary? Your best bet, just call your spouse if you have to. A lot of people... Text them. Text, text them. Yep. A lot of people will forget. You'd be amazed. You think it's just a joke, but the amount of guys who forget their significant other's birthday and their kids' birthdays. It's like, was it January? Was it 82? Yeah, yeah. It, it, hap it happens a lot. And especially, and I'm part of that demographic, young guys. If you give us a form to take home and say, fill it out and bring it back, she gone. It, it's, it will disappear. I won't even know where it ended up. So it, it's always good, like, like Lori recommended, just take the extra two minutes. You're already filling out a bunch of forms as it is. Get them to fill out that form. If they need to call someone, have them make the call or text them right, right down friend. there. Phone a friend. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Another point to make is, are you guys checking your billing statements every month? I know we try and tell you that every time Say we meet yes. with you. Say <laughs> yes. yes, you're checking your billing statement every month. That's gonna be your, your, your check. Is Bob on the plan or not? That's, that's another way just to cross-reference. Are the right people on the plan? Did we take people off the plan who've left? So check those billing statements every month as well. Number three, our company's payroll deductions are based on a 50-50 split. What happens when an employee's life and disability premiums total more than the health and dental? Ooh, it's quiet. <laughs> Someone has an answer. Raise a hand. Somebody want to guess? There's They're two, scared. There's, there's two They're right scared. answers. Two of the answers are correct. C is correct. And B, you can't see you're smarter than you think you are. You just <laughs> 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 Essentially, what it comes down to with, with taxation is if, as the employer, you're paying any piece of the life insurance or disability and not t 4 that amount back to the employee, that benefit becomes fully taxable to the employee on claim. So what that means is if you're the employee who's disabled, you're already only going to be getting around two-thirds of your weekly or monthly salary. Then if you get hit by the tax man, then that's going to be dropped down to closer to the 50% range, right? And when you're on long-term disability, it's a matter of you know, putting food on the table, keeping the lights on, that kind of thing. So we do have benefacts that we can provide to you with a little bit more detailed information about the taxation of group benefits. If anybody needs it, just give us a call after. Um, the other thing too, we've helped many employers with putting together what the, uh, what the breakdown is, the employee-employer split. We can help you with that. We have spreadsheets. So. All right, number four, maternity leave. Yay. An employee will be off work on a maternity leave soon. What are the options for benefits during the coming year? A, she can be removed from the plan and reinstated with no waiting period within 31 days of her expected return to work date. Is that right? Right, that's correct. She can remain on the plan, but because there will be no payroll deductions while she is on leave, you will pay the entire cost. Is that correct? Ah, see, that's kind of a trick question because you will be responsible for that cost, but if you've offered to your employees 
to your employee on maternity leave, you can actually request post-dated checks from them. So that is, that is true. C, she can remain on the plan, but if she becomes disabled while on leave, she won't be able to apply for disability coverage under your plan. Hmm. If she's taken the benefits, she actually can. If something happened to her on maternity leave, she can apply once her mat leave is over and then the waiting period would begin. So you actually can, if you are on maternity leave, your maternity leave, if something happened to you, it could turn into a disability claim. D, she will not be eligible for benefits because she won't be actively at work. Mm -mm. So the answers are A and B. Now, in Saskatchewan, we leave it up to the employers to decide, are we going to offer benefits to our employees while on maternity leave? That's at your discretion if you want to offer the benefits or if you don't want to offer the benefits. However, you have to treat every single employee the same way. If you're going to offer it to Susie, you have to offer it to Betty. Now, we do have many different templated forms and letters that we have to help you out in these situations for if you are offering the benefits, how to handle the collection of the premium. Do you want to still continue the 50-50 split, what you've had in the past? Then we're going to have those post-dated checks. Are you going to pay the full amount? Hey, that's pretty nice of you. It's really at your discretion. The catch is, once that employee has decided that yes, I want the benefits, or no, I do not want the benefits, they cannot change their mind. It's for the full term of the maternity leave. Exactly. Are there any questions about maternity leave? <laughs> I love babies. I, so. I'm just going to interject. <laughs> I know it sounds rather, you know, weird that we're going like down to the details. You got to have a date. You got to know what to do when it's an NSF. But we do get calls from people that go, like, you know, I'm just trying to be a nice person, and I'm just like giving them another chance. And then the check when NSF. Do, do I pay them out? Like, how long do I give them? And and meanwhile, there's a liability at risk. So you do have to be very clear in your process, and you cannot waver from that. I mean, it's to your discretion. There's gonna be a lot to your discretion, but then you need to know too. On a lot of these situations you're setting precedent so you've got to be very careful with that okay number five with the downturn in the economy we have to temporarily lay off some of our employees should or can I keep them on the benefits plan anyone no we have a no over here a strong no over here <laughs> And so why, why, why do you say no? Because why, if we lay them off and they're going to go find another job, why would it be there? There are, and that, that's a good point. I don't know that they're coming that's back. A Likely they're not. Excellent argument. Especially in our industry, we're plumbers, mm -hmm. and we have to lay off. We're exactly the situation for yeah. two years. So we've laid off tons of guys, and why would it have to So, so did every, can everybody hear her? Okay, so she's saying, I've laid you off. You're no longer my employee, so no, you're not on the plan anymore. And you know what? She's well within her right as an employer that when you do lay off an employee. However, as the employer, you can keep those employees on the plan too. So, yeah. Exactly. In this, and in your situation, yes, that, that totally makes sense. In some situations where, say, not just a layoff due to slowdown, but a layoff due to weather or something like that, that you want those employees back, you absolutely can keep them on, as long as it's pre-approved, you talk to the insurance carrier before, and you'll see that's a very common theme with a lot of our answers through both parts of these, is keeping the insurance company in the loop throughout the whole period. Uh, as long as you let them know and they approve it, you can have an extension of benefits um, to encourage that employee to, to return to work. One thing to consider is, you know, when that employee is laid off, have them talk to one of our amazing financial planners that are all over the room here. They can help them set up what's called a conversion option. What that is is a plan that you can roll your group plan over into an individual plan, uh, as long as you do it within 60 days with no medical questions. Then with that employee, you know, there's work again or it's spring, whatever the case may be, you can reinstate that employee and waive the waiting period and they would be effective. Yeah. What do we recommend? Well, we've seen it where we've kept employees on the plan thinking, hey, yeah, we want to have them back. When employees are laid off, and if they're not working, sometimes they have a lot of time on their hands to be utilizing those benefits. And you may find yourself in a position where your claims have really skyrocketed because, well, I'm not going to work today, but I'm going to go to the dentist and take all the kids to the dentist and, hey, feel like I need a massage. It just, it's just something that can happen. The benefits are there. They will get utilized. So it's something to be aware of if you do want to keep the employees on the plan. 
Um, again, if you are going to be doing that, get approval from your carrier first. You cannot offer benefits to not active employees without speaking to the carrier. Can no, I? Oh, sorry. Uh, did question? you have a question? Yes. Yeah. You can waive the waiting period, yeah. And, and again, I want to reiterate, there is many options, but what we are seeing, and I totally understand with respect to the economy being a little bit tough, you want to keep those employees engaged, and so therefore you're going to extend those benefits. Maybe you're going to pare it down, but inevitably, you're going to get that bump in claims of usage, and we're just seeing it. So we have to, you know, and people will say, I, I understand that, and I'm, I'm prepared to pay that extra cost if it means I'm keeping these people. But you need to play, that, that has to play into your decision, absolutely. Yeah, and we can like discuss that further with you privately if that's something that you do want to get a little bit more information on. Yes? I'm assuming if you laid them off and then continued their coverage, you would keep them off the yeah. It's dependent on your carrier. Can yeah. you repeat the question? So the oh. question was, she's assuming that if they were laid off, it is only health and dental and not disability, was the question. Yeah, and it actually is dependent on the carrier. Some carriers will extend disability up to 31 days, some for longer. It would depend on your carrier. Um, we don't recommend having disability for employees who are not actively at work. Health and dental, yes. So, yep. All right. Number six. I always get these ones. A 14-month employee repeatedly falls short of our expectations. If we pay her two weeks wages in lieu of notice, do we have to extend the benefits too? So she's not a very good employee and we're cutting her loose. <laughs> Are we gonna give her benefits for those two Nothing weeks? like the honest truth, eh? <laughs> <laughs> you betcha. You're just saying what they're thinking. I know, right? Yeah, see? <laughs> what do you guys think? Are you gonna keep her on this benefit plan or are you gonna? Perfect. Someone throw in an answer. Challenge yourselves. So, so we have an A, a D, D. B, D. 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 Elemental P. We're all <laughs> over the place here, guys. There's no law in Saskatchewan that says you got to give that girl benefits. If you do want to give her benefits, though, you have to get permission from your carrier. So your carrier might not even allow her to have benefits. Exactly. But yeah, the correct answers are B and D. No, the Saskatchewan Employment Act does not address benefits, and no, in Saskatchewan, it is up to the employer whether benefits will be extended or not. So. And that's, because we, the only reason why we bring this one up because it has come up as a situation. As I say, we always find out something new. It is much more prevalent out east when you get into Ontario, and when you're dealing with a federal, like, big corps like that, they're challenging this type of thing. But in Saskatchewan, we've never, to my knowledge anyway, unless someone else can speak to that, I've never had someone that has actually been paid out benefits over that period of time. Because I would think that we would know that because we, we would be asked to ask on their behalf, but it's not happened. So um, it's a little bit of a dangerous position to be in, quite honestly, to do that. Um, because probably there is some hurt feelings through that process and not sure if that would go anywhere good. But again, you need to do what you need to do. Mm -hmm. Hello, Pat. Definitely. Did, did you guys did hear Pat? Pat? Oh, Can you, you know what? I'm thinking if you want to repeat it. <laughs> they can repeat it. I can repeat can that. Repeat yeah, I, heard her, I heard her loud and clear. Okay, good. So <laughs> what Pat was saying is that, okay, so this, we're talking about an employee who's not meeting your expectations. It's a little bit different when you've got an executive type employee or like a long-term employee that maybe the, there's other reasons why you're letting them go and you do want to extend those benefits. So when you do want to extend those benefits, you still do need to contact the uh, carrier as a severance package. Can't just say, oh, we're going to give you a severance package and we're going to keep you on the plan for six months because you know what, you've been a great employee. Well, no, you still need permission. So, so it is situational. So thank you, Pat. That's 
Chamber of Commerce plan, right? Yes. yes. I'll let you speak on that. Yeah, and that every carrier is different. And in that particular scenario with the chamber, it always does go for the employee to the end of the month. Can you yes. just repeat the first part, Matt? So what you're recommending is not what is You should still let the carrier know when an employee is resigning to let them know that that was their last date of active employment, regardless of who your carrier is. Yeah, exactly. But with this specific carrier, the, the employee actually isn't terminated from the plan until the end of the month, and that is situational as well. So she was just c concerned about when you are terminating, or is it a termination, or is it a resignation? So. Did that? Did everybody understand that? It was good? Okay. Yeah. Did, did you understand me? Yeah. You know what? <laughs> I don't understand a lot of stuff. <laughs> I'm just saying, no, I did. <laughs> Otherwise, you guys will have to take over the company. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're going to stop there. We're going to give you guys a break. Kate, question for you. Um, we do have our panel ready to go, but I'm thinking we're on a roll, and we're in good time. So would it be okay if we just keep doing this? And then what we'll do, I don't think anybody needs a coffee break quite yet. So when we're done this, we'll have a coffee break, and that allows us to set up our mics and all that for the panel. All right. I do have some treats I want to hand around, but I'm having a hard time fitting in between these tables. So, yeah, some prizes. But you know what? I'll tell you what, in the second half, if you throw up that red hand, you get a prize. <laughs> Sarah, Sarah. Pressure. <laughs> it's candy, I saw. <laughs> I know, but it's Halloween. <laughs> yeah. Okay, just moving on. Number seven. An employee was hurt on the job and has applied for a WCB claim. We also have short-term disability as part of our benefits plan. Do we have to let our insurance company know? So we have a lot of yeses. Because we always let our insurance company know when our employees are not actively at work, right? Yeah, you'll see, like, like I said before, it's a very common theme through a lot of these. Open, transparent, talk to the insurance company. They're the ones that have your back, right? So you, you uh, being open means that uh, everything will go a lot smoother. Another aspect of it is if you start the forms for short-term disability right away, there could be potential where it A, tops up the WCB benefit, or while that person is off on a WCB claim, if something else happens to them. Then the forms are done and all that, and then the payment can start much sooner than uh, if you had just started the forms you know, retroactively. So the correct answers are B and C for number seven. Does anybody have any questions or comments about WCB? We're getting into waiver premium. <laughs> <laughs> We're getting there. We're getting there. <laughs> we have our Blue Cross expert in the corner. <laughs> All right, number eight. Hey, I got the flaky employee again. Our employee is off work on a short-term disability claim, but the return to work date came and went, and she didn't show up. What's the next step? <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> So what are you going to do? She said she was going to be here. <laughs> I'm hearing a lot yeah. of stalker on Facebook. Okay. <laughs> now, if they're not watching your internet usage, you could probably start stalking her on Facebook. Um, first thing you should do, what have we been telling you all along? Contact that insurance company. Talk to her case manager. Maybe something came up. Maybe like, we don't even know. So let's get those communication lines open. Let's start there. Um, another option, call her. Hey, you okay? What happened? Right? E exactly. Yeah. S speaking from experience, when I was on a disability claim, I was off for about two months with a back surgery. And during the whole time, I was communicating with the insurance company, with our office manager, Pat, so everybody knew exactly how I was doing, what state I was in, when I was coming back. So keeping it open and transparent like that, hopefully you never have a situation like this question come up. The correct answers are A and C. You are not within your right to fire, to turf her off the plan. Don't do that. And like I said, if you want to stalk her on Facebook, go nuts. But um, <laughs> communication is the key in this, in this situation. So. Number nine. An employee has been off work ill for six months. Can I terminate him from the plan if we don't have disability coverage? This one's tricky. Yeah. Because all these have been so straightforward. <laughs> this, this is the tricky one. <laughs> here's, a, here's another curveball for you. <laughs> yeah. I heard a D, I think. Anyone else want to take a crack? You got the little hands. 
They no. don't want candy. They don't want candy. Diet. It is. We do have a wellness plan, so now I'm just making <laughs> feel really guilty. I'll eat it all if you so guys don't want it. Trust me. Back to the office. So. <laughs> Woohoo! We like food. Um. <laughs> exactly. So, correct answers really on on this one are A, C, and D. So there's there's a few aspects of it. Again, and I'll harp on it again, but but let the insurance company know um, when the employee is not actively at work. Uh, one thing that will do is trigger a mechanism called life waiver of premium. So what that is, is when an employee has been totally disabled, usually for about four to six months, uh, this will trigger and it means that the employee will no longer have to pay their life premium. Now this doesn't mean that the other premiums will be waived, like health and dental, but the life insurance premium would be waived, meaning that life insurance claim is payable. Um, do you have a policy in place for disabled employees? And everybody actually on your tables, you'll see the thing that says sample. Can everybody pull that out? This guy. And I can guarantee you, you have seen some form yes. of this in the past from our office. Yes. And, and it's, it's just a new, template. This is the new version that we yeah. have done. So one thing that we would, you know, can't recommend enough is when you leave here today, I know everybody is really busy. So thank you for spending the few hours with us this morning. But when you go home, or back to work. <laughs> home. Home, <laughs> ideally. Home. When you take home. the afternoon off. We've had a long day yeah. already. <laughs> <laughs> Have a cup of coffee and sit down and, and force yourself to make some decisions on this, especially on extension of benefits. Because where you really run into problems is say you have two employees. Your nephew, great employee, hopefully you maybe take over the business one day. You have Bob. 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 You were going to can Bob on Monday. Because he didn't come back after his short-term right. disability exactly. claim. Exactly. So See, that's, if that's Bob, yeah. <laughs> so if, if they both become disabled at the same time, you have to treat them the same, right? And having a policy in place means that not only there's there no questions, you, you have it. They've signed off. You signed off. There's, an, there's a copy in uh, their employee file, their personnel file, and the employees have a copy. Then the employee side, they also know, okay, I have three months, six months, 12 months, 24 months, whatever it is to, you know, get prepared for when I'll be falling off of benefits. Yeah. There is no law in Saskatchewan that says how long you must keep an employee on a benefit plan if they are sick. So what we're kind of doing is forcing your hand to say, okay, for your company, what is going to work for you guys? Are you going to keep them on, like Matt said, six months, one year? How, are, how is that premium going to be covered? Is the employee going to pay a portion of it so that they are aware of it? If the employee doesn't want to pay a portion of it, well then yeah, you could take him, potentially take him off of the plan. But it's better to have these conversations before you're in the situation. We get the phone call quite often. Well, he's been on disability. Yeah, what do we do? So, and actually that's coming up, so. Perfect. Yeah, okay. So yeah, I guess that'll lead us into question 10. Um, our disabled employee has been on long-term disability claim for almost a year while remaining on the plan at our expense. Can I remove him from the plan? Can you? I know I've had this come up a lot, so someone has to have an answer We this get crowd. this call. We do get this call. We have a no. Anyone else want to weigh in? We have A. So we have a yes, we have a no. Yeah, so A is yes, you are not obligated to continue to pay his health and dental premiums, but you will need to implement a company policy doo -doo -doo, <laughs> for all employees and give him notice of the policy and time to convert his group coverage to an individual coverage. Let's not just be mean and turf him, let's give him some options here. So the poor guy, he's sick. Um, B is incorrect. Simply terminate him from the plan, we don't recommend doing that. That could come back to haunt you. C is correct. Yes, you can remove him from the plan or you can ask that he start to pay all remaining premiums himself. D, no. Since you started to pay, you must now continue until he returns regardless of whether high health claims affect the rates for everyone. D is incorrect as well too. So again, this goes back to that sample form that's in front of you. We're very much encouraging you to sit back and do some serious thinking about how you would handle a situation like that. Don't say it's not going to happen, because it's going to happen. <laughs> and what we're, what we're finding, a lot of people are asking, A, what, what is an appropriate time frame? It, it is to your discretion. We probably see on average uh, a year to two years, but the two years is pulling back to the one year, the one year is pulling back to the six years, um, which will kind of lead into a little bit to the panel, uh, the issue of rising costs. Uh, we do often get the question going, I want to just be that nice person, but then when they get that renewal, 
They're going, ay, ay, ay. And they can peg it. They know where it's coming from. So there is a moral side to this. I understand that. But there's also a business side to it. And I don't think there's ever a right or a wrong answer. Um, you'll never feel good. It's kind of like being a mother, mm -hmm. right? But in the same token, you need to make sure that you do what you need to do to protect the company. I think that'd be the first and foremost. And be there to certainly facilitate or help the employee. Um, one thing that we often get to, um, and it kind of rolls into this, is people have actually terminated employees. They're gone, they're done. They, they, it's, a, it's a trucker that's never coming back. And we will find out going through an audit that these people actually are still on the billing and they're paying premiums for these people. Um, in one situation, it was a call from the spouse that said, because they did what they were supposed to do, they terminated the employee, therefore the benefits were um, provided on, an, on a conversion um, uh, level. But he, well, no, I don't even think the conversion was even around. This was a t about four or five years ago, so there really wasn't a conversation. And anyway, at the end of the day, his spouse phone and said, very, hap very not happy, wanted them on the plan, and the owner just put him on the plan. He'd been terminated. And they put him on the plan, re-enrolled him into the billing, and they've been paying for four or five years, and it's killing their plan. And now they don't know how to let him go because they're scared to get the call from the wife again. I mean, I get it. It's <laughs> tough. It's but that. That, they don't need to extend those benefits. They're just trying to be nice people, but that's a problem in today's world. So, and if you do find yourself in a situation like that, where you have this employee who is on disability on your benefit plan, and you want to implement a policy extension of benefits uh, policy, contact us because we do have templated letters. We can help you with this. That's part of one of the services that we offer to you. So, we can we can line them up with one of our with one of our financial planners to convert. So there are options available. It's not that we're going to be mean and just kick them off the plan. We're going to give them options. Exactly. Yep. And All right. our last question. Number 11. Our employee's husband has been diagnosed with cancer. Can she go on a short-term disability claim to help him deal with this? So we have here, a lot of C's. Yeah, because a lot of the stuff does depend. You're, you're getting wise to the trick questions. I'll just throw <laughs> in the maybe there, yeah. <laughs> So really the correct answers on this one are B, C, and D. When it comes to a disability claim, every single person is different, just like when it comes to stress. Lori may be able to handle some stress. No. That <laughs> in my hypothetical example, no, that, that I may not be able to function with that same level in that same situation. Everybody's totally different. Where it becomes a disability claim, however, though, is with a disability claim to be payable, there has to be a treatment plan, there has to be a diagnosis. So that person has to be actively seeing specialists on medication, whatever the case may be, actively looking to improve their mental well-being. Because there is an inability to perform your job. Exactly, and, and in this case, and I know some of you have this on your plan, some may not, an Employee and Family Assistance Program, or an EAP. It is one of the best tools to help mitigate uh, a lot of this. So. It can, it can help the employee decide what the next step to take. So you can call the number, it's completely anonymous, and they, their specialist could say, okay, no, you need to see somebody about this, this is major, or they could give you some tips, some tricks, some things like that to help you know, mitigate it so you can return to work. Yeah, your EFAP is a really handy little tool if you do have one on your plan. The majority of our clients are using them now. It's basically a counseling service. It's available to you. You can call them. You can email them. You can have them set up for texting as well. You can arrange for in-person, one-on-one counseling as well for a variety of issues that you may be facing, whether it be a spouse with cancer, whether it be financial problems, issues in your workplace, anything like that. That's what Teenagers. they're there for. Teenagers. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Good stuff. So back to compassionate care, though. Yes, and that is another option, uh, the government program for compassionate care. It's 28 weeks. Uh, you, if you are on disability, that may stop, probably will stop during that time, but that's another option for you. If you, know, you have a direct family member, a, a parent, you know, someone like that who's very sick, and you need to take time off to be with them. Yeah, so it's basically if you just need that time away just to be there for a loved one who is terminally ill, you're actually going to be up to 28 weeks versus 17 weeks on a short-term disability claim. So you may want to look at the the compassionate care program rather than right away jumping onto your group benefits short-term disability because really you're going to have a much longer time away so but there's things to consider when yes. you do that and that's the only th again it's not for us to decide 
But if you put someone on, if they take the choice of going compassionate for the, the opportunity to get a longer time with their six child, spouse, whatever, um, you need to determine what and if you can provide benefits for them. So health and dental might be the easier one that we can extend those benefits, but quite likely they're going to lose their uh, disability and or potentially the life insurance. So it has to be requested the insurer, um, but I, I'm not, and maybe to the, the, the suppliers here, the insurance companies, maybe you guys can jump in. I'm not sure if they're gonna be too hot on extending LTD benefits uh, for up to 28 weeks. Yeah. Any thoughts? Mike, Chatham? If you didn't hear that, he said generally a month is uh, the common practice yeah. that he's seen. So, and, and we're dealing with that right now where, I, you know, there's a lot of stress in the family um, and there's a decision this employee has to make because now there's one at home who's already on disability benefits. Now the second parent gets taken out of the scene and they don't have any disability benefits. What happens if something happens? Yeah. So common theme again though, as Deb mentioned, before you, when you, you do have an employee who is considering compassionate leave, compassionate care leave, contact the insurance carrier because that employee will not be actively at work. So it's not that you're really requesting information, you're actually just letting them know. They're gonna be, it's not gonna be as difficult. Exactly. Yeah. So that's all the questions we have. How did everybody do? Everybody is super smart. Who got 11 out of 11? That depends. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, kinda, sorta. Do you want a treat? I'm like a, it's like a puppy dog. Do you want a treat? school pop quizzes? <laughs> I don't know if the girls in the back want to maybe toss some chocolates on the table because everybody's too scared. They're too scared. So Kirsten, maybe when the break comes up, we'll throw some candy on the table for them. So. All right. Okay. Thanks for your time, guys. Good. Okay. So how'd you make out? <laughs> thanks, guys. Thank you. This is the part that is the part that drives us crazy a little bit too just so you know you guys deal with one company we deal with 600 and there's lots of questions that come in and everything's a little bit different so we're challenged a lot we enjoy that um, but um, as I mentioned before we're learning as you're learning in some cases I mean just dealing with this whole issue with compassionate leave this changes everything again right so every time the government makes a change we need to understand how that impacts benefits and how that impacts you as the employer so if you're not sure of something, we're there to take the call, we're there to do the research. And these things, as much as I know you have lots on your plate, these are very important questions that you need to identify with. Please do go through that checklist. We always encourage it when you hire, on the orientation, you go through the checklist, you understand what the rules of the game are, because it's, I call it the cover your butt letter. Um, but you also wanna do it on a post, if there's an exit, give this your chance to cover off the questions that you would normally why are you leaving all those things but also very important talk about those conversion options again before and after because we have seen where it's not been our company or our client sorry um, is that the, the employee did not know they had a conversion option and actually went self-employed and when I was talking to this individual she's got a health problem and she's a one-man company doing HR and she cannot get benefits but she had the option to get a conversion where she was, and it was a fairly large company, but did not know that she could do that. So it's our job to do that, even if you put it into writing. Um, that way on the exit, if you have to mail it to them, you've done your job. It's their, em the employee's onus to follow through with it. You just give them the go, the phone number, talk to the planners, and your job is done. Okay? Come run day. Awesome. Let's take a quick break and then we'll get suited up for the panel. Um, and we'll have our draw after and a couple other miscellaneous things. And anything else the girls tell me I missed. <laughs> <laughs>